In the prologue to John's gospel, the first chapter of John, uh, some selected verses, and as we read this together, uh, keep in mind that where you read, in the beginning was the word, and anywhere else that you find word, if you were reading this from the Greek, which thank God we don't have to do, except for Nathaniel who will get graded on it, but the rest of us, uh, but if you were, you'd see that word is a, a Greek word, logos. Logos actually means mind. So when John wrote this, what he was actually saying is this, in the beginning was the mind of God, and the mind of God became flesh and dwelt among us. What a powerful image. So think about that as we read it together. And I invite you if, you, if you wish, it's in the bulletin, to read these words along with me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the Word was life, and the life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. The Word became flesh and made His home among us. We have seen His glory, glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Together, O oh God, we have heard your word. Together, O oh God, we have spoken your word. Together, O oh God, may we receive the power of your word until it becomes our own. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as I said, it is so, so nice to be back here with you in January. We left snow and ice in North Carolina. Uh, from what we understand, we're going back to more snow and ice. But here we are uh, in the beauty of Florida. And it was the same way in November when we were here to preach. It was one of those unseasonable cool spells up in the Carolinas. It felt more like January than it did November. But we came down here, and on Saturday afternoon, Paige and I spent most of the afternoon on the beach, in recliners, uh, some in the water, uh, just, just enjoying the beauty of South Florida. And, and while we were there that day, uh, just drinking in the loveliness of this place that is your home, uh, we noticed, in fact, she pointed out to me, I was looking at, at, at the, the, the seascape and the sailboats and the fishing boats and the beauty of the waves, and she said, look, look at those clouds. And there was, there was this constellation of clouds, like an inverted pyramid. I had never seen anything like it before. Uh, from the water rising into the heavens, broadening as it went, blacks and grays and silvers and whites of the clouds, and where it touched the water, you, you really couldn't tell where the water began and the clouds ended. It just merged. It, it, Michelangelo could not have painted that. This was the handiwork of God, and it was one of those things that had never been before and will never be again. It was the moment and it was wonderful, with minimal exception on either side. Minimal exception in surround sound stereo. Part of the exception was John from Wells Fargo. How do I know his name or where he worked? Because John from Wells Fargo was about five feet from me on a chair with a cell phone. I counted for an hour, an hour. He was talking on his cell phone, call after call after call after call. Hi, this is John from Wells Fargo. I wanted to check on that contract. Is this going to be through next week? Hi, John from Wells Fargo here. I wanted to update you on your loan application. Hi, this is John from Wells Fargo. 
Are we going to make that deal we've been talking about? Because I think I can make it really pretty for you. Hi, this is John from Wells Fargo. Got your call, wanted to call back. And uh, <clears throat> I kept making little remarks, and, and Paige kept going, shh. But the stereo part is that on the other side was another man. He was not on his cell phone for an hour. It just felt like it. Maybe 10 minutes. Uh, he didn't introduce himself. Apparently, he didn't have to because his voice sounded, it was recognizable, apparently, to whoever he called. It sounded like he had smoked eight packs of Marlboro a day for 40 years. One of those voices, rah, down there. And, and apparently, he was setting up some sort of a, a, a dinner, maybe a corporate thing, a family thing, a wedding rehearsal dinner. I don't know. But he was talking to the planner. And he was going through his little litany. Uh, wh why is it that if I am putting the wine on the table, it has to be an open bar? Why can't they pay for their own drinks? Why is it <laughs> that I have to have beef and chicken? Doesn't everybody like chicken? Can't we just get by with chicken? Why do I have to pay to reserve an indoor space if it's going to be outdoors? Oh, I know it may rain, but why am I paying for one space I'm not going to use? Why do I have to pay the valets? Aren't they getting tipped? Isn't that an, anyone on it? And finally, I thought, you know, you're having financial problems. Why don't you just go talk with John from Wells Fargo? <laughs> and do it quietly and just get it over with. And I thought, what a metaphor for life. How many times have I done, maybe none of you is guilty, how many times have I done this? How many times have I sat on the beach and missed the ocean? Those guys could just as easily have been behind a desk in an office in Dubuque or Omaha. This beautiful handiwork of God that had never been before and will never be again, they missed it. And how many times do I miss it, whatever it is? The late Methodist Bishop Bev Jones, wonderful, wonderful man, used to say, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. So how do we do that? That's what I want to think about with you briefly this morning. How do we keep the main thing the main thing? How do we make sure that we don't sit on the beach and miss the ocean. That we don't become so overwhelmed by the busyness of life that we miss the beauty of life. And I'm going to give you two answers, which come from the Bible. Two answers from me are worth nothing, but these are straight from God's Word. The Bible says, how is it that we keep the main thing the main thing? Two answers. The first is people. We just read from the prologue to the Gospel of John, the first chapter, these beautiful verses, powerful verses. We read them together, frequently associated with Advent or Christmas, but the word becoming flesh is not something that happens one day a year. And the word, the mind of God, became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's how John said God came to intersect the world, to interrupt its busyness through Jesus Christ. Isn't that how God still comes most of the time? When you experience the living reality of God most of the time, isn't it through somebody, through the Word becoming flesh, through incarnation? If, 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 we are attuned to the moment if we don't miss the ocean. If we are open enough to see God when God comes to us in somebody, if we recognize. When we were in New York, we used to, a couple of times a year, go to the Metropolitan Club for lunch which to me was a wonderful experience because lunch there included four rooms there was the room where you sat and ate, but down there, there was this long room of nothing but bread and cold stuff. And then there's this long room of nothing but hot stuff. 
And then there's this other room of nothing but dessert. And when I die, that's what I think heaven will be. <laughs> so we would go to heaven for lunch, and, uh, and one day we were there and bumped into a, a, a friend of ours, uh, another minister, and Catherine, our younger daughter, was with us. I guess she was, what, page 12, maybe? Maybe, even, not, maybe not that much. And, uh, uh, but she had gone to the dessert room. We bumped into this friend and we're chatting for a moment and said, oh, I wish you could meet our daughter. Where is she? I said, she's, well, she's getting dessert. I'm on my way there. I'll find her. So we go in a few minutes, Paige and I, a few minutes later, and, and there's our daughter and there's this minister friend, and they're over at the ice cream table. And he's showing her how you can mix caramel and chocolate in just the right amount. And she's showing him what sprinkles to put on afterwards. They're having a great old time laughing and talking. He passes by his way out. We were planning. He was going to be a he's preach at our church, uh, and, and I was going to do something for him with his radio deal. And, and we, we said, well, we'll talk later. I'll give you a call, da 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 Walked over to the table, and there's Catherine with her ice cream. And I said, you know who that was? And she said, no, but I guess he's a religious guy. And I said, yeah, well, why, why would you say that? And she said, well, he's a friend of yours, and he has that funky collar on. And I said, that's not officially what they call it. But yeah, he's got that, that clerical collar on. And she said, so yeah, I guess he's a religious person. I said, but you have no idea who it was. She said, no, but I know he knows a lot about ice cream. And I said, um, well, it's a guy named Cardinal Dolan. And he could someday become the first American ever elected pope. And she said, I don't know anything about that, but I know that guy understands good ice cream. <laughs> and I was really proud of her that she liked him just because he's a neat guy and they had a moment of fun together, and that's enough. But I also thought, how often is it that, that somebody crosses our path and we fail to recognize. Particularly, we fail to recognize God's fingerprints on that person, how that's an incarnation moment, how the Word has become flesh for us, and maybe we're surrounded by clouds and shadows and darkness, and the light will shine through if, in fact, we're attuned to the if we recognize it. We were back in New York the first weekend in December and uh, spent three or four days and, and circulated and saw a lot of our old friends, ate in a lot of our old haunts, went to the Metropolitan Club, and they had, had downsized from those four rooms to just regular meal because of COVID. And I thought, doggone you, COVID. Uh, but it was, still, it was still good. And we, we, we chatted with people in the South A. And one day we walked down. Uh, Fifth Avenue and stood on the corner at 29th and looked at Marble Church, who looked at my old haunt. And uh, Paige said, are you going in? I said, no. There's somebody in my office. <laughs> There's somebody wearing my title. There's somebody in my pulpit. Somebody else is at my church, meaning it's not mine now. It never really was. But I felt nostalgic the rest of the day, and the next day, Sunday, we were flying back, still felt kind of nostalgic. I really think it was more than nostalgic. I think it was sad, just sad, knowing what I had lost, how much I loved every minute of those 10 years as Doug loves his time here with you, every minute. And now it was gone. And all day Monday, the next day, I, I felt that sadness. That night, we had a birthday party for our grandson turning two. And we were there, he and his five-year-old sister and our daughter and son-in-law. And We were there, and they, they, uh, they served chocolate cake. And I, I bet a hundred times that night, the five-year-old, I heard her say, Papa, look at this. Papa, watch this. Papa, let me show you this. Papa, this. Papa, that. And they, chocolate cake, you know, and they would crawl on you and hug you and leave those fingerprint streams all down your shirt. And uh, went home that night, and I thought, 
I don't feel as sad. And then came the most remarkable week of, of sitting on the beach and God forcing me to see the ocean. The most remarkable week. I had been with those two little ones. Then we get a, a, a card in the mail uh, from my son. Why would my son write a card to his parents? But here's a card thanking us for what we did for him at his wedding. And then I get this phone call from Mark. Uh, Mark was my uh, executive minister in Winston-Salem and then up in New York. He's in Charlotte now. And, and Mark said, look, it's, it's almost Christmas. We got to get together, but we've seen each other in three months. Let's get together. It's almost Christmas. When can we meet for dinner? And then I got a phone call from Steve McCutcheon, uh, a Zoom call. Steve's a retired Presbyterian minister down here in Florida. And he said, it's almost Christmas, almost Christmas. And it's not enough just to hear your voice. I want to see your face. We got to catch up, dear friend. And then I got a phone call from Lee. Lee and I became friends in seminary. He officiated at our wedding. Lee said the same thing. Man, it's almost Christmas. Can we meet for lunch? We got to get together before Christmas. And then I got a phone call from Jesse. Uh, Jesse's a judge up North Carolina. He and I were roommates when we were 17. We've known each other over 10 years. <laughs> We've known each other well over 50 years. Over 50 years, and he called the same thing. Almost Christmas, can we get together? Can we meet for dinner? And, and when we hung up, Jesse said the same thing he's always said at the close of every conversation for over half a century. Love you, brother. And I realized by the end of the week, there was no sadness left. There was elation. There was no sense of loss. There was a sense of what do I have? Incarnation, the Word had become flesh. God had reached out to me through people. And isn't that how it happens? Whatever we may think we lose along the way, whatever the difficulty, however the dark, dark the cloud may be that surrounds us, however empty we feel at any given moment, if you can name a handful of people that you love and who make you feel like you matter, do that for a second. Just, just a second. In your mind, think of three people, just three, who you love, who make you feel like you matter. Three names. Did you come up with three? Then whatever else you may lack in life, you, my friend, are rich. To keep the main thing the main thing, the Bible says just look at the people God brings to make your life worth the living. And the second word, how do we keep the main thing the main thing? How do we sit on the beach and see the ocean? How do I manage not to become so overwhelmed by the business of life and the busyness of life that I miss the beauty of life? The second word is perspective. People, perspective. Uh, and that's why I appreciate so much Caroline reading that verse from Proverbs. As we think in our hearts, so we are. Perspective. Uh, there's, a, there's an old quote attributed to everybody from Winston Churchill to Norman Vincent Peale to Ralph Waldo Emerson to Abraham Lincoln, probably to some of you, I don't know. It's been around forever. Whoever said it, thank God for them. Whatever we decide to look for in life is probably what we will find. As we think in our hearts, so we are. God on the elevator over at Seagate today. Um, and thank you for allowing us such a nice place to stay. And got on the elevator, and there was a, a young lady who is an employee of, of uh, the establishment, and she got on, and she said, I hope you're having a good day. And I thought, well, it's only 730. <laughs> I mean, what could have happened so far? 
And I said, yeah, I'm having a good day, and I hope you'll have a good day too. And she said, well, I guess that's up to me, isn't it? I said, yeah, I guess. She said, uh-huh, it really is. Today's going to be whatever I choose to make of it, and I choose to make it good. And I thought, you should have come over and preached. You'd be <laughs> just as powerful and quicker. She was just a delight. I choose to make a perspective. Jesus talked about that. Remember he said there were these two men standing in front of the same window, looking at the same property, watching the same stuff grow out of the ground. And one of them said, oh my God, look at the weeds. Let's burn it down. The other said, no, no, no. I'm looking out at that same stuff. And I see wheat and the promise of a harvest. Life is what it is. We don't have the power usually to change that, but we have the power to interpret that. We have the power to decide, I will allow life to be bright. Oh, the, the, the rain will fall. Jesus said that too, remember? The sun shines and the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Sure, the bad moments will come. But we are given the power to say, even in the midst of all that, I will look for goodness. And I believe goodness can be found. Perspective, as we think in our hearts, so we are. When I was an undergraduate in college, uh, back in the, the mid-1840s, uh, the uh, Thanksgiving break was about two days off, and uh, a bunch of us were sitting around the lobby in our dorm talking. One of them was a student there named Sandy. I think he was from Maryland, Delaware, Maryland. Anyway, a wonderful guy. He was smart. He was also wise. But Sandy had, had been the victim of childhood polio, and so he, wa he walked with those large heavy metal braces on each leg you know you you've seen that and it's it's required to keep the leg straight and he also had those heavy wrap around metal crutches so the way he walked now picture this across campus with a backpack on would be to plant the crutches and swing forward plant the crutches and swing forward walking from one building to another was laborious for sandy and yet Somehow Sandy managed this, this positive outlook on life that would have made Peel proud. Uh, Sandy wore a big smile. He was, he was a, an intelligent guy. He, was, he, was, he looked for the best. Uh, and that's not easy because whenever we went to a dance, he had to stay back at the dorm. Whenever we decided, let's go out and play tennis or basketball, he had to stay back at the dorm. Whenever we said, let's go for a hike, in this beautiful spring weather, he had to stay back at the dorm. He couldn't do those things. Oh, we got to go other places that we didn't about twice a week to doctor's appointments that we would never have to worry about because it was unique to his illness and his recovery. But still he maintained this, this perspective. So there we were getting ready for Thanksgiving break. And we're talking about our Thanksgiving plans. And that morphed into Thanksgiving itself. And what do we have to be thankful for in life? And that morphed into today. Somebody said, let's, let's make it more specific. What happened today? I mean, we may have had a terrible day, but I bet there was one thing that happened to every one of us sometime today that was good. Let's go around the circle and talk about that. What one good thing happened to you today? What one thing today was said or observed or experienced or received for which you're thankful. So we started around, you know, as we students were back in the day. Uh, some of the answers were spiritual. Uh, some of the answers were serious. Some of the answers were sarcastic. Uh, some of the answers were just silly and fun. Got to Sandy. Sandy had been sitting there the whole time uh, reading in a textbook, preparing for some class the next day, but also listening. So we got to him, we said, okay, Sandy, how about you? What happened today? One thing for which you were thankful. And Sandy looked up from the textbook. He said, well, this morning I got up and we all leaned forward because it's Sandy. He's smart. He's wise. 
He's going to tell us something we need to hear today. He saw something, he received something, he heard something. Something happened, and we want to know what it is. But he surprised us. He said, well, today I got up, and then he went back to reading his textbook. That was it. Today I got up. Maybe I have pains. Maybe I have problems. Maybe there are pitfalls I have that you guys don't know, he was saying. But today I got up. Today I opened my eyes and received a brand new chance at this thing we call life. Today I caught up. Others didn't. But I did knowing that it at least had the potential to meet somebody, just an acquaintance or a stranger who could become a lifelong friend, to hear some nugget of insight that can change the way I see the world for the rest of my days, to learn something, to see something, to feel something. Today I got up. Isn't that enough to make me thankful? As we think in our hearts, so we are. The world is what the world is. The question is, what are we going to do about it in our own lives and experience? Can we reach the point of saying, I am thankful. I am so thankful because today I got up. So, how do we manage to sit on the beach and see the ocean? How do we manage to keep the main thing the main thing? How do we manage not to be so overwhelmed by the busyness of life that we miss the beauty of life? And the Bible says two things. People, if you have even a handful of people that make love come alive for you, and perspective, if you can realize each day when you just get up, that there is potential out there to make it something you've never felt before. People, perspective. Focus on those things and you will find what Jesus called life in its fullness. Or as Bev Jones said, you'll be able to keep the main thing, the main thing.